Welcome to the very first episode of Some Assembly Required with the Assembly Democrats. This podcast is hosted by the Wisconsin Assembly Democratic Caucus, discussing what's happening in the state capitol and all things Wisconsin. I'm your host, Wisconsin Assembly Democratic Leader Gordon Hintz. I represent the 54th Assembly District in the city of Oshkosh. Today, we're going to be starting off talking about nonpartisan redistricting. And you've probably heard a lot about redistricting in the news, both in terms of the impact on our elections, but more and more about the impact on governing in the state of Wisconsin and in other states around the country. In 2011, Wisconsin Republicans drew maps for extreme partisan advantage using the mapping technology available to ensure that they would have a built-in majority, even in the most even and democratic elections. For instance, under the old maps in one of the worst Democratic years in 50 years, Assembly Democrats won 39 seats. In 2018, in one of the best Democratic years, Assembly Democrats only won 36 seats. This is because the seats are largely geared to have more Republicans than Democrats in them. But don't just believe me. In 2016, a federal district court ruled that Wisconsin's maps were unconstitutional and stated that the maps were, quote, intended to burden the representational rights of Democratic voters by impeding their ability to translate their votes into legislative seats. So the Republicans' partisan gerrymander was ruled unconstitutional. This was appealed to the United States Supreme Court, who didn't actually rule on the issue. They ruled that the plaintiffs did not have standing and is another way to punt on the issue. Another redistricting case involving North Carolina was ruled on recently, and the court also punted making a decision, saying it was one that was more political and not for the judiciary. So that leaves states like Wisconsin stuck with their existing maps for one more election. But that doesn't mean that the state has to go through this again. In fact, there are ways that the state can make sure that we have nonpartisan redistricting and not have a partisan legislature draw districts for, you know, where they pick their own voters, not having the voters pick them. Last week, State Representative Robin Vining and Senator Dave Hansen drafted legislation addressing nonpartisan redistricting. The bill would direct the Reference Bureau to draw redistricting plans based upon standards specified in the bill and establishes a redistricting advisory commission. And now here's a clip from Representative Vining's press conference. The public overwhelmingly supports Medicaid expansion. 70% of Wisconsinites support Medicaid expansion, but those views are not represented in the majority of the Wisconsin state legislature. The will of the people is being blocked. In short, why are we not expanding Medicaid? Partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering is wrong when Democrats do it, and it's wrong when Republicans do it. Democracy is enforced by the accountability brought by an election every two years. And when politicians pick their voters instead of the other way around, they're insulated from the accountability required in a democracy. If you're a politician and there's no chance that you're going to lose an election, there's no accountability. It's simple. They don't have to listen to voters if there's not a chance that they'll lose their seat for either not addressing an issue or for making extreme decisions because they've created legislative maps that have effectively insulated them from the will of the public. Today, I'm inviting my guest, State Representative Greta Neubauer from the 66th Assembly District, which includes the city of Racine, to discuss further the impact of redistricting, not just on our political maps, but how it impacts the decision-making that governs the state of Wisconsin. Welcome, Representative Neubauer. Wow, thank you for having me. So uh, let's just talk first about the issue that I brought up. Why do you think gerrymandering matters uh, to people in your district and throughout the state of Wisconsin? Such an important question. Every election really should be a performance review of us by our bosses, who are our constituents. And with gerrymandering, it's very hard for voters to give that feedback and feel truly represented. You know, when I'm in Racine and knocking on doors, I hear from folks about gerrymandering. We know that it undermines people's faith in the democratic process because they don't believe that their votes matter in the way that they would if we address gerrymandering. When people don't feel heard or represented, they might stop showing up, they might stop calling, they might stop voting. It really disrupts and damages our democracy potentially for the long term. So one of the things, I mean, sometimes people will highlight there seems to be a disconnect between decisions made in the legislature and perhaps things that the public supports. And I think we've 
We've seen that on some of the issues, perhaps medical marijuana, Medicaid. What's the connection between you know that disconnect and partisan gerrymandering? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Medicaid expansion, right? We worked on this issue a lot throughout the budget process. We know there's overwhelming public support for the Medicaid expansion. And yet we see Republicans in the assembly, particularly Speaker Voss, saying over and over, uh, this will not happen on my watch. We need to have politicians who actually feel accountable to their the people in their districts. Otherwise, we are not going to see the kinds of policies that Wisconsin wants and Wisconsin needs come out of this body. And so, I mean, we, you know, we have the issue. It's been around for a while. It does seem to be getting more traction. Um, I think you gave some great examples about how it contributes to the actual policy making. Um, what do you think the lay of the land looks like now? Um, we've had two court decisions in the last two years by the Supreme Court, which essentially punted in that they didn't rule on partisan gerrymandering. Uh, they simply didn't make a decision. Um, what do you think the future looks like in terms of how uh, legislative districts are drawn in Wisconsin and, and the likelihood that we'll be able to pass something? Well, it's going to be hard. You know, it's going to take people engaging in this process for us to see fair maps in Wisconsin. The Supreme Court said that partisan gerrymandering is, quote, a purely political problem and that it needs to be addressed by state legislatures, not by the federal court. So the way that I see it, it is our job as voters, as constituents, as people who care about the integrity of our democracy to make this a political fight. What that means is that people need to show up. Um, as you mentioned, Gordon, we have a bill out, Assembly Bill 303, sponsored by Rep. Robin Vining and Senator Dave Hansen. We need the public to show up on this. You know, I like to say to my constituents, I'm going to do everything I can for you inside the building, but we actually need you to show up for us to be able to get these policies passed. So we all need to demand that our legislators support fair electoral maps. 72% of Wisconsin voters support nonpartisan redistricting, according to a Marquette University law poll. You know, we need to make it toxic if a legislator doesn't support fair maps because gerrymandering is toxic to our democracy. And I think that's well stated. I hope that we don't, you know, this is something that we should be doing, not just for the current makeup of the legislature, but for future legislatures, uh, legislators. So, um, well, one of the reasons we started this podcast was to give people the opportunity to get to know uh, their elected officials. And in, in my case, I think we've got some great colleagues that I really want to give the opportunity to talk a little bit about so people can hear more about them. So for you, <laughs> Representative Neubauer, um, tell us about the exact moment that you decided to run for state assembly, because I always describe that as the biggest decision that you can make. You know what? I'm going to put my name on the ballot. I'm going to go forward. Talk about what that was like for you. Yeah. You know, for me, there there were a couple of moments, but I think the one I want to point to is that I remember, as I think many of us will for our whole lives, the moment uh, that I realized that Trump was going to be the president of the United States. I was in my apartment. I, I had a bad feeling. And so I skipped the parties and went home and sat in my apartment by myself on my couch. I was under like 10 blankets and watching the news and feeling this real sense of despair washing over me and um, my roommate comes home and she's like first of all you're sweating so much right now um, and you know sort of starts folding up the blankets and we start talking about uh, the new reality that we were facing and I realized that you know I and we were going to have to be braver and make greater sacrifices than we may have planned I, I was not planning to run for office. Um, I grew up in a political family, but it wasn't something that was I thought was in the cards for me. There are obviously a lot of things that make this job really amazing, but there are also parts of it that are really hard. Uh, but in a political moment like this one, when I really do feel and and our people all in our in our state and across the country feel that our democracy is at stake, you step up in ways that you didn't think you were going to or you were going to be able to before. And, you know, I saw all of these young people, women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ people stepping up and really felt that I had to do that too. 
you won in a special election, which is a little different in that it was the only thing on the ballot, um, but it was a competitive race. Has that changed the way at all that you, you know, um, how you approach things? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it really, I think, deepened my understanding of the role of a legislator and how multifaceted it is. I came in towards the end of the session, you know, and voted on a few hundred bills in a couple of weeks. And that's, of course, a critical part of our job. That's what the public most often sees. But we're not just policymakers. We're also a critical link between our communities and our government. Um, you know, I was able to be around and be in my district when really hard things were happening or when people were questioning uh, their faith in the democratic process and be able to actually have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. If that seat had been empty, um, you know, those conversations, that work wouldn't have been able to happen. Soon after I got in, I was also part of the lawsuit to hold special elections in Wisconsin. Um, Scott Walker was planning to not call elections for those seats. And um, that was, you know, I think a moment in which I and the rest of our state really reflected on the importance of maintaining the integrity of our democratic institutions. I've been thinking about this a lot as we've been having the conversations about an accurate census count um, and joined the, joined the lawsuit on that. You know, uh, it's obviously a theme for me. It was part of why I ran that, that I think people um, need something to feel hopeful about. They need to see us fighting for the integrity of, of the democratic process and of our state. And so while these things, a census count may not sound exciting or a special election, really these are sort of the bedrock of how our legislative districts and how our democratic process works and really I think influences what people feel in the community and whether or not they feel like their electeds are fighting for them and um, they should keep engaging in, in the process. So your special election was in the winter or spring of 2018. Uh, so you're in your second term, but your first full term. Um, you know, what is your what are you working on right now, um, and what are your goals for the rest of the legislative session? Yeah, so I um, I was doing work with young people around the issue of climate change before I ran for office. That's something that's very close to my heart. Um, as the youngest woman in the assembly, I certainly feel a responsibility to my fellow young people that are going to have to grapple. With that issue over the course of our lives. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in Racine. I'm sure we all feel that way about our districts, but people are talking to me about access to quality, affordable health care, about housing, about good jobs, wanting their kids and grandkids to have the same kind of opportunities they had in our community. We're talking about criminal justice reform and inequality. Um, the way I like to build policy is really in collaboration with people in Racine. I don't believe good policy comes from us sort of sitting up here in Madison, but really from talking with people in our communities and trying to find creative solutions to these challenging problems. So we try to have a lot of time in the district. We've got a meeting coming up this week with the co-hosted with the LGBT Center of Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, we're working on bills related to issues facing the LGBT community. Um, we've also got uh, a town hall coming up on mother and infant health, particularly focusing on racial disparities and infant mortality. So trying to have those community conversations and build some of that collaboratively. Um, we've, we've been talking about it, but of course, we're always gonna be focused on restoring democracy and, and fair maps. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, climate will be a critically important issue for me. And, and I believe that we can use this political moment as an opportunity to create good jobs in Wisconsin and reduce inequality. So we will be talking about that, too. More to come. Well, now we're going to go to what we call the speed round, where I ask random questions where there may be no right or wrong answer to, to see how some of my colleagues think on their feet and perhaps tell us all a little bit more about who they are. Nicki Minaj or Cardi B? Cardi B. Name one of your favorite all-time summertime jams. <sighs> I mean, we're peak summer right now, so <laughs> what did you have on over the weekend? Or what are three songs on your playlist? I thought, you know, sure. a summertime anthem might be easier. Okay, I'm going to say um, I, every summer, find myself listening to the entire soundtrack from the movie The Parent Trap with Lindsay Lohan, so that would be a, that'd be a classic favorite. I, you were not alone. <laughs> um, would you rather live in Buffalo or Phoenix? Phoenix. 
Taco Bell or Taco John's? Taco Bell. All right. With that, you're off the hook. Thank Whoa, you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Greta Neubauer, for joining us today. And thank all of the listeners for joining us on Some Assembly Required with the Assembly Democrats. I'm Gordon Hintz. Until next time.